Welcome back, dreamers. Your host, Ken, here with some exciting news that I just couldn't wait to share. Somewhere in Dreamland now has an amazing new merch store filled with custom Somewhere in Dreamland hoodies, t-shirts, coffee mugs, pint glasses, and much, much more. So what are you waiting for? Why not hop on over to dreamlandpodcast.weebly.com and grab yourself or someone else some custom Dreamland gear now. is Daryl Sims, the alien hunter. Daryl is the world's leading expert on alien abductions. His 38 plus years of field research is focused on physical evidence and led to groundbreaking discoveries of alien implants and alien fluorescence. As a former military police officer and CIA operative, Sims has a unique insight into the alien organization, which he believes functions similarly to an intelligence agency. Sims is also a compassionate and skilled therapist who has helped hundreds of alien experiences all over the world come to terms with what they have witnessed. So without further ado, grab your blankets, turn down the lights, get comfy, and let's fade away into... really appreciate you coming on the show. I've been, I'm excited to talk with you, and uh, how are you tonight? I am delighted to be here. Good deal, good deal. Well, hey, Daryl, just, just in case there's folks out in my audience who aren't familiar with you, could you give a little background on yourself and how you got wrapped up in this whole phenomena and ultimately how you became known as the alien hunter? Well, I was, uh, the best way to describe me is... It, how I got involved in this sort of phenomena is I was a captive audience, literally. By that, I mean captive uh, at age four in 1952 in Midland, Texas. I uh, opened my eyes and something was in my room. I realized something was wrong. And there was a skinny, spindly looking little alien creature, for lack of a better term, uh, standing there in my room. And, uh, he was walking toward the ball like he was going to bump into it. I didn't realize he had just come through it. And um, that's the first time I had ever seen or knew anything about an alien, so to speak. And uh, that little thing uh, was, was stunning to me because when he turned around and saw me observing him, I realized he didn't have a genitalia. He didn't have a belly button. And uh, he had black, big black round eyes that were perfectly round, not like the... TV version with her elliptical, and uh, <clears throat> that was my first experience. That those experiences went on for about ten of them for a period of uh, thirteen years. My last event was when I was seventeen, and um, and it ended quite violently. And I thought, well, this is, you know, the, the, yay, it's maybe it's over. And then the problem was they came back and got my son when he was six years old, and that changed me from a concerned father to an alien hunter yes sir i i i have uh five boys of my own i couldn't uh imagine how that made you feel uh, you definitely want to take care of business uh i mean you know somebody tampers with your kids that's it yes sir yes sir now, you mentioned these things had round eyes and what we know today is the alien grays which i'm assuming is pretty much what you were describing have kind of well i guess that we depict them or see them as 
having oval eyes. What do you think the difference is there? Is there any? Well, in my opinion, the differences between the eye patterns with the alien uh, in a in, in the most basic form is that it was a different model. Okay. So saying that it was a different model would imply that uh, possibly these things aren't uh, living creatures or they aren't either born or, well, you said they didn't have a belly button or anything. So uh, that would assume that they were hatched or manufactured. Is that right? That would be a, an accurate description from my point of view. Uh, I've studied this phenomenon for over 50 years, and I can assure you that um, the entities that we're looking at, in my opinion, are models. They're not necessarily aliens from other planets, uh, in my opinion. Uh, they have craft that are quite huge and have been, we actually have some film footage of them. And uh, they, for all practical purposes, when you live in a craft 50 miles thick, 600 miles across, you don't need a planet. Yeah. Because that's that's where you were hatched, cloned, made, or manufactured. I mean, that makes sense to me. Um, let's back up for a minute. How far back do you think that this phenomena has been happening in your guesstimation? Well, the uh, the best way to answer the, the question, I think, is to address the abduction phenomena. The abduction phenomena is no more, no more than 150, 200 years old at the very most. The answer to the question, has the aliens or those who made hatchment or manufactured them been around for longer? Of course they have. Yes, of course. But the, the abduction phenomena, in my opinion, is just a program. And uh, this, they're one of a number of programs that have been run against humanity uh, from time immemorial. And this was this particular program is simply I, I call it the contact phenomena, and uh, that's that, that's the long and the short of it. All right, yeah, because I've talked to a couple other researchers out there, and some that have really, really, like really cool ideas, like Joshua Cutchin and, and uh, Stan Gordon, who who think that this phenomena goes back to, like, even the fairies, and they're almost the same thing. What do you think about that? Well, the, 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 if, you, if you study the phenomena, and I have worldwide, I've got 2,000 cases worldwide, and uh, every, and as a former police officer, um, if, I, if I see a group of people standing around a dead body and a knife sticking out of its back, uh, let's say there's eight people standing there, and I ask them, okay, officially, um, how did this guy die? And everybody gives me eight different stories. At that point, uh, everybody gets to go downtown. Because that body did not die eight different ways. Right. By the same token, when I go around the world and I hear eight different stories of the alien phenomena, in other words, where they came from, who they are, and so on, I realized that at least seven of those stories are not true, maybe eight of them. So the question is, why is somebody lying to me? and Why are they telling these fabrications? And unfortunately, many investigators buy into these one or more of these uh, stories. In other words, if you go to the, to the Irish, they say, you got to watch out for the wee folk because they might not bring you back. Yeah. And if you go to Turkey, uh, Istanbul, Turkey, and talk to them, I said, we don't believe in this sort of thing. There isn't any aliens. And you ask them, you know, what about the jinn of Islam? And they get real quiet and say, oh, you got to be, be careful about them. They may not bring you back. And when you start listening to the stories of every one of these countries and all their information, it's the same story. It's just a different flavor from that culture. That's all. Or, or even a different program, maybe, because of that culture itself. It's possible, uh, but generally speaking, when I, for instance, like when I went to Slovakia, uh, they have MIBs there, they have the whole nine yards, they have the, the MIBs even dressed the same exact way as they do here in America. It's just really fascinating to see how really similar 
the phenomena is worldwide. Yeah, it is, it is a crazy phenomena. I mean, in I like it that when I get the opportunity to speak to someone like yourself who's been in this field for so long and has gained a reputation like you have and who actually puts in the work to to look at the whole picture instead of just going down one path. I appreciate that. Um so we met you mentioned a little bit about places in in that that makes me wonder in your research just how much does lineage play into into the abduction phenomena? Well, lineage plays a a, a fair amount into the phenomena because uh they're um in the, like in a, the our, our particular case with our family uh they in our particular case they got the uh three of the males out of the family and uh and this is pretty amazing uh, because they uh, one has asked the question well how do they know how do they how do they know to get more people out of your family why the people out of your family what what are the stats, so to speak? And the stats basically show that forty-five uh, percent of the people taken will be Native American, uh, Native American, Indian, Irish, or Celtic. And uh, this is a pretty staggering number uh, from such a small segment of population, so to speak. Interesting. That is very interesting. Now, do you? think that there is possible that there are people that are walking around out there among us that uh just don't know that this is happening to them and it's it is or maybe they're just putting putting it off like not not wanting to look at the picture that's a really astute question and uh, most people don't have the snap to ask it the fact is they're in the contact phenomena there are three primary groups of people First are referred to as the uh, uh, contactees. These are people who are think that whoever the beings are, whoever's doing this, they're doing it for highest and best good. And it's probably the really good idea for us to, uh, they're helping us out in some way or another. They're upgrading our DNA or something like that. And these are called contactees. They bought into the scenario, the, the line that the uh, alien uh, throws out to everybody and as a result uh they they're pretty much uh, stuck in the in in that phenomena the second group of people are called abductees these are people like myself who were kidnapped and simply don't like it i mean they didn't ask for it and and here it is happening so they want it stopped so to speak the third group of people are people uh they're a smaller group of people. By smaller, I mean uh, there may be plenty of them, but they they don't know who they are. And uh, I'll give you one quick example. Um, one engineer uh, came to Sedona, Arizona, and they said, well, I've filled out your forms, and 33 out of the 35 things that you would describe as an abductee fit me, including the rare drug allergy to procanes and so on. And they said, I still believe in that. And I said, okay, I don't, I don't care whether you do or not. It's, I can't, I, you either are or you're not, you know, I can't make you one thing or another. Sure. Long story short, two years later, they came to me and said, well, I would like for you to work with me. And I did. And they found out that they were in fact an abductee and have been since childhood. So these are the third group of people that simply don't know they've been taken. Okay. Now, do you think that some of these people that are taking, taken, I'm sorry, um, do you think that they, some of these people actually develop almost like a Stockholm Syndrome type of response to these events? They, uh, we use the term uh, alien Stockholm Syndrome to describe the fact that many of these people buy into the narrative of the alien that they've been taken since they were children and uh, anything that they, the alien tells them that basically whatever, that, that's it's reason that pedophiles and others prey on children because they're, they're susceptible. They will buy into their narrative. And uh, the same is true as the alien. And as they do this with children, they, it often works. They will buy into 
whatever the whopper is that they're being told. So long story short, the um, um, the, the that whole narrative, so the, the Stockholm syndrome, so to speak. In other words, where you identify with your captors, whatever they're they're told, you're told. You just simply buy into it. If that is the case, then uh, we certainly have a, a good many of these people are fall into that category. Okay. Now I know through your research, you you give uh, walk me through if someone come to you came to you and said, hey. Uh, Mr. Sims, I believe that I've been an abductee. I'd like you to to help me out with this. Walk me through the process, if you could. Well, a lot of people uh, contact us literally by uh, uh, email and so on, and uh, or they listen to programs like this one, and they'll say, "Oh my gosh, so that that could very very well be me." But when a person contacts me through email, as an example. And uh, I'll give you a case, an actual case in point. A young man contacted me and said, I want to know about, uh, I, I think I was taken when I was younger, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay. Uh, he said, but there's, my mother was present during the times that I was taken. And I said, did you ever ask her? And he said, no. And I said, well, uh, you might not want to do that. He said, what do you mean? I said, this is like opening Pandora's box. Once you open this box, you're never going to get it shut. You think you will, but you won't. And he said, well, I have to know. And I said, "That's it's up to you, but I'm just telling you, this is the, my best advice to you. Let it go if you don't, if you can live without it. <clears throat> so he goes to his mother, tells her the whole story. And she looks at him and says, oh, I didn't know you, you remembered. Of course they took you. But they always brought you back. I was always there. Wow. <laughs> he was horrified. He said, now what do I do? I said, I told you not to open the box. Yeah. Now you have to live with this stuff for the rest of your life. Like, why me? Why? What does this mean? And all these other things that you're going to now dig in for forever that the alien will never tell you the truth about. They don't, they're not in the business of telling people truth. They're in the business of deception. Yeah. Um, why, why do you think that in your opinion that aliens are, are taking people? I mean, is it, are we like, uh, 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 an experiment? Uh, is it for their own self-preservation? What do you think? No, I, I, I think the, I think that the seven primary models of aliens that we're referring to that show up in the literature, these are models. And the best way to think of them is if you went to a, a Chevrolet company and you looked at a Chevette, you could you could uh, use that as an illustration of a model uh, of, of car. The low end of the of the Chevy company would be like a Chevette, when that would be the little gray. The high end would be the Nordic, such as the uh, or in the Chevy company. That would be the uh, Corvette Stingray, so to speak. So you have these different models, but basically they're still models. Therefore, if they're models, hatch clone, made, manufactured for some specific purpose, the alien may not even have a clue why they're doing what they're doing. They're only made for the purpose of getting the job done. The real questions one have to ask is. Who did that, and what do they want? Yeah. But as far as the alien the, themselves, they they're here to do their job, and uh, if it's to mutilate a human being, they'll do that, or a cow, or if it's to make you think you're special, unique, chosen, and one of a kind, or whatever, they'll do that with equal enthusiasm. It makes no difference. They simply here to do their job. Do you believe that there's a hybridization program going on with them? Well, the best way for me to answer that is a is a from a former cop physician. My belief is irrelevant. It's what I can prove or reasonably have evidence of that will support the the viewpoint. And the the answer to the question is: Are there hybridization program going on? There's no question that has been going on. 
for some time. And the real question is um, to what end? What is the purpose of hybridization and so on? And uh, there are those out there in the UFO field who think hybridization is extremely widespread and it's everywhere. They're, they're hiding under every bush, so to speak. I don't uh, find that evidence to be true. Uh, I do think that uh, hybridization does go on. We have some evidence uh, biologically that that is, in fact, true. Uh, as to the full extent of how far it goes and so on, that I don't know. I simply haven't met all the hybrids lately, so that's <laughs> a little bit difficult to pin down. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, let's talk about some of the evidence that you have uncovered. I know that you have done a lot of work with with so-called implants. Um, it, it, tell me a little bit about that and what you've found in that part of the spectrum. Well, the alien implant phenomena is something that I discovered in 1960. Uh, in 1960, I was age 12 and, uh, and was abducted outside my home in Almogordo, New Mexico, about 3 o'clock in the morning. And the interesting thing about that, I was wide awake during the implant procedure on me. And so, therefore, I knew quite a bit about, knew about that then and knew, know a lot more about it now because uh, I was present during the event and was the recipient of a nasal implant at the time. So, implantation is extremely rare, and your audience should know that. Uh, there are... There are many people who write me and think because they were, they saw a UFO or they were abducted, therefore they are implanted. That is simply not the case. Implants are extremely rare, and there are partic particular reasons. And uh, most people that have contact experiences are not implanted at all. If you've seen, been near, or been close to a UFO or an alien, you're already programmed. You don't, an implant's irrelevant. You're already part of the program and don't even know it. Okay. Um, where, where are these implants usually found or predominantly found, I guess I should say? The, uh, the implants phenomena, uh, the, uh, the objects themselves can be found anywhere in the body from the top of the head, literally from the, in, in, in the, uh, the brain, in, the, in my book on alien implants, you'll see one of them the size of a lifesaver inside the lady's brain. Wow. And it's absolutely remarkable. One of the biggest ones we've ever seen. And uh, sometimes they can be in the arms, the legs. Uh, we even have one that was removed by a... Um, by a mortician at the request of the the family from the man that died, he claimed he had an implant in his leg, and after he died, they asked him if would they check his calf muscle, and they did, and sure enough, there it was, and they sent it to me for study. So these objects can be in different parts of the body, from the hands to the feet to the legs, um, chest, they, they're literally anywhere. Normally when they're discovered by the person, uh, do they, is there a level of discomfort? How, how do they find these things? The, uh, the way the implants are normally found, believe it or not, is quite by accident. They don't generally provide any type of, uh, of physical discomfort, pain or torture or anything like that. They're there uh, to be, uh, to, to be installed and not to be noticed, basically. It's it's extremely rare to find them. Uh, when people do find them, it's usually uh, a result of uh, an accident, such as a doctor. Um, oh, they got a case, again, a case in point. We have a couple of friends that went to Area 51. They went camping uh, out there together. And uh, two friends, one of them wandered off in the middle of the night and come, walk, come back and he was having a problem with his knee, and he said, they, the lady said, what's the problem with your leg? He said, I don't know. He said, I, my knee hurts real bad. And he had already been abducted, and they had been planted four, which is extremely rare, mm -hmm. four uh, tic-tac-sized implants in the tendon of his knee. 
Wow. When he went to the doctor to find out what the problem was, the doctor x-rayed him and found the four Tic Tac size objects in the tendon of his knee. And uh, the doctor removed them and gave them to him and says, I don't want to know what they are. I don't want to ever see you again. I don't want to know nothing about anything. So and with that, he gave me three of them and kept the other, one of them. So that's how I acquired those. But uh, again, this these are found almost accidentally, and it's extremely rare for someone to have ill effects like uh, an injured knee, as an example, from implants. Okay. And when you get these objects, do, do you test them at all? And how, what do you do? We uh, certainly do test these uh, objects. Uh, we do a, a battery of tests. I've, I've done, conducted 27 surgical interventions, wow. removing the lead stalin implants from around the world. Uh, one of the last, the, the furthest country I've been to to do this was in India. And that was about three years ago. And the latest uh, implants were removed was in Houston. I removed two of those uh, um, in Houston here, Houston proper. And that was about uh, six months ago. And the point is that uh, these objects then normally are taken by me to various laboratories and tested of uh, depending on what types of material it is. In other words, if they're metallic, we would take them to materials lab of uh, physical uh, for uh, metallic uh, evaluation and so on. If they were uh, plastic or some other type material, we'd take them obviously to a different type of laboratory because the database is going to be different. Uh, we'd take them, if they're biological, we're going to take them to a lab that's primary function is biology. Otherwise, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. You're you're not going to get a lot of a lot of good information from labs that are not designed specific for for that type of material. Right, right. Now, what what when you when you get these results back, what what are you finding? Are you finding any correlations between any of them, or what kind of materials are they normally? Uh, generally speaking, the a lot of the correlations of the. There are many different materials and there are many different places in the body where they might be. All of those define, in my opinion, the function of the implant itself. Uh, but in the first uh, two surgical interventions we did out in uh, Camarillo, California, uh, the objects were um, taken to uh, Los Alamos and New Mexico Tech an evaluation was done on those objects at the time and what was found was that they were rare uh, uh, like quarter inch long uh, if you can imagine a needle broken uh, into, quarter, into quarter inch long pieces uh, that's what they look like lamellar or needle like projections and they were from a rare meteorite from outer space Wow. The lamellar projections in the man's hand and in, in the woman's foot, all of, all of those uh, were remarkable, to say the very least. The labs were not told that these were alien implants. They were simply told uh, these were these were objects uh, to be evaluated and, and reported to, to the National Institutes for Discovery Science, uh, Bob Bigelow's outfit, yep. and uh, they paid... Twenty-two thousand dollars for the studies that were done, and at the at the very end, the uh, unfortunately, someone on the team was not supposed to, but they told them that these were alien implants. Of course, at that point, uh, they went in and tried to change all the reports to to say something different. The good news is that I had the original reports, and then their quote unquote amended reports. Ah. Uh. There you go. So you mentioned that you think that, in your opinion, the different places that these implants are found in the body do different or have different functions. What, like, what are the different functions, in your opinion? Well, some of the implants appear to be uh, as, as 
there to uh, alter behaviors. In, in some rare cases, we will find some of our abductees have, uh, have got altered levels of neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and, uh, and so on. Uh, if that's true, and, and it seems to be true in these rare cases, uh, a neurophysiologist told me that, Mr. Sims, if your findings are accurate, uh, my God, she says, whoever put those implants in that person owns them. They literally control that person's behavior. They can make them sad, depressed, glad, or anything else. They basically own you, and they decide whether you're going to be happy, sad, or whatever. Well, that explains a few crazy people that I know then. <laughs> 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 oh, man. So you you said that you you've had one guy that had four of these implants, like, and you said that that's really rare. That was actually one of my questions. Uh, how many times have you had someone with more than one? Uh, it's extremely rare. The the first case uh, was a lady. We had she had three of them in her foot, <clears throat> and the remarkable thing about the the implants was not that just that they were there. The remarkable thing was, nor even that they were lamellar projections from a rare meteorite called the Widman Staten or the Yautschung meteorite. The, the really amazing thing to me was the biology surrounding the metal objects. The biology, the objects were in, encased in a biological cocoon, uh, a, a, a biological in, in, in entrapment so that the body would not recognize they were foreign objects at all. The body never, ever uh, attacked them. Like a, like if you have a splinter in your hand, there's an example, within a day or two, your the splinter will really start to hurt because the, the body attacks it because it's a foreign object. Sure. And you know, white blood cells will pour in there and it, it gets real painful. The remarkable thing about these particular implants is they were housed in a biological cocoon that turns out to be keratin. Keratin is your surface skin, your fingernails, or your hair. In other words, it doesn't it doesn't happen inside the body, deep inside the body next to bone. It's impossible. Yeah. In fact, when the when the uh, doctor looked at that, he was amazed. He said that. He said, well, that, the, the biological cocoon, he said, those are undoubtedly, uh, um, they're, they're, it's all, that, all that is is just a, uh, uh, it's a, an inflammatory response. Those are inflammatory cells. And I said, okay, that makes sense to me. Test them. We said, we know it is. I said, I want you to test them. He did. And to his shock and amazement, there were no inflammatory cells present. None. Wow. That is. But he said, this is keratin. He said, keratin can't be inside the body. How can this be? This is impossible. And I said, well, we had 17 witnesses, uh, two attorneys, uh, one attorney, uh, two doctors, myself as hypnotic anesthesiotherapist, and, uh, and we had it all filmed. He said, I don't care if God be present. He said, this is impossible. Wow. That is super, super intriguing now, isn't it? Well, uh, we were confronted by a, a Nobel laureate at one time, and he said, Mr. Sims, if you can replicate that non-inflammatory response, that biology on the implant, if you can replicate that in a laboratory, you may have a Nobel laureate find now. And I said, how do you think? And he says, because organ donor rejection could be passe as a result of that find. Wow. And I said, well, that would be remarkable. But uh, I said, uh, doctor, I said, I, I was born in Texas and I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. <laughs> what laboratory do you suppose I could send the samples to and expect them to actually return to me and to be a, 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 a true scientific study would be done without somebody stealing the evidence? He said, none. Yeah. How often does that happen with with stuff that you find and you send out. I, I imagine there has to be a, a certain level of guard that you put up as you do your most, research. Most of the time, I take the, the items myself and I stay there with them. 
in, 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 in less than an extreme circumstance or I have other parts of the sample, then I might, under certain circumstances, give it to a trusted individual scientist to uh, do certain studies on. But generally speaking, I'm there whenever the science is done. Okay, that, that's smart. That's, that's the way to do it. So you were speaking quite a bit about programming and programs uh, being installed in humans when they, they come near or in contact with a UFO or an alien. Uh, what, what exactly are we talking about? Well, programs are, uh, these are residual, uh, the best way to think about programs for your audience, this, this will make, take this very dark and bizarre subject to make it much more practical. Uh, on your, on your phone, there are things called apps. These are little tiny programs that you can click on and they're added to your phone. Think of the aliens programs as apps that they install in you without your knowledge. One of the apps that uh, we notice in people, uh, uh, once you fill out, once you come to me and say, I want to want you to evaluate me or whatever, one of the things you do is fill out this about a 20 page forum and it's a lot of handwriting involved. And I'm a handwriting analyst. One of the things we look at is your handwriting to see uh, the kind of answers you give, and two, if, the, if you're lying, you have propensity to lie, exaggerate, and so on, it shows up in your handwriting. But the the big thing is that in the, in reviewing that information in that form, um, when we look at your handwriting and other things, sometimes we can spot one of these apps running, uh, and we have to ask the question, is that an alien's app? running inside you a program or is it due to something else for instance uh obsessive compulsive disorder that's that happens to people it yeah. does they become obsessive compulsive but some abductees become obsessive compulsive they haven't the slightest clue why interesting yeah that this is uh this is fascinating as heck man I i'll tell you it's uh it's really, really a fascinating topic, and uh, I, I'm glad that there's people out there like you that are really taking a hard look, and I really appreciate the approach that you take with it as well, um, because it is very matter-of-fact and uh, to the point. Like, I noticed that you said, uh, you're, you know, what matters is the evidence and what you can prove, and I like that you said that because, you know, Opinions are opinions, and what you can approve, what you can prove is fact. I mean, uh, I just appreciate that about your research. Well, we you have to do that, and I'll give you uh, your audience a good case point. Uh, many years ago, uh, there was a case in uh, Louisiana area in which a woman and her a, a, a woman and her daughter were raped in front of their 15-year-old son. He was tied up while they were raped by this vicious man. And at some point, the DA thought they caught the guy because they found circumstantial evidence in this guy's van. And uh, anyway, long story short, they didn't have anybody else. He was in the area. Looked like it could have been him, so therefore they tried him. And they couldn't prove it in court, so they dropped the charge. Uh, later, the DA wanted came back the second bite at the apple, and they uh, they tried him again. And uh, and th th after three trials, they finally got this guy. And they and friends of mine were horrified, and they they said this, this guy should be executed and all this. And I said, well, you don't know that he's guilty. Yes, I do. We all know that. We, I said, you don't. Public opinion doesn't make anything a case. Long story short, is a man later, you, 10 years later, in, in jail, in prison, they find the guy that did it, and it wasn't him. Wow. He lost his family, lost his reputation, lost his business, 10 years of his life, and all these people ready to hang him. And he was absolutely 100% innocent. 
So it doesn't matter what I think or what it looks like. It matters what we can prove. And because they didn't do that, they went with public opinion on that case that destroyed the man's life. Yeah, that's sad. It really is. It's it's really sad. But I mean, I guess that's that's uh, where we're at with it with certain things these days, you know. Well, that's that's why your audience needs to to be of the opinion of. Well, let me give an example. Of, I, I I use seven different hats to to uh, study this phenomena. In other words, uh, I use one one of the hats that everybody has. In my opinion is called the UFO hat. The UFO hat is a hat that we all have. In other words, uh, it believes in flying saucers, UFOs, and things like that, and is really interested in the subject. The only problem with wearing that hat is it can be fooled, and often is. The second hat I have that I wear is the cop hat. As an extra cop, I have a, a, a totally different approach. Basically, it doesn't believe anything you say and is looking to put the story together to see if there even is one or if you're fabricating it. So that's a totally different hat. Then I've got a medical hat, which uses Bayesian logic to to uh, to ascertain types of information in cases. Then we've got the science hat, in which we literally use the science to uh, codify our, our answers and our information, which makes it much stronger. Then I've got an intelligence hat, which doesn't rely on any other bodies, any other hat. It, it's an intelligence hat functions vastly different than other hats or other methods of investigation. It uh, wants to know exactly who's behind it and, and what the actual ultimate plan is, like about the alien. Everybody wants to know who they are. They the intelligence hat wants to know exactly what's really going on. Know what you think's going on. Doesn't matter what you believe is going on, but what actually is going on. Then I have a Native American hat, uh, which involves uh, the historical uses of of all of those abilities. And then the last hat I have is a spiritual hat, which is really involved in looking at this totally from spiritual viewpoints. So all these different hats I use when someone tells me their story or their information, all those hats are looking at your story at one time. And some of those hats don't even agree with each other. Yeah. But they're going to give me 14 sets of eyes to look at something with where other investigators are so busy. They're busy with a, a pen or pencil, a laptop, a camera, photographing lights in the sky or something. Uh, I don't chase you opposed with a laptop and a pen and pencil or in a camera i hunt the pilots yeah that's that's uh that's a really good way to put everything and uh i like the 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 hat thing i i do it's it's uh i like that you're looking at everything for you're looking at the same thing from all these different angles and i wish more people would do that as well because you know once one of your hats could miss something that the other one picks up too, you know? That it's happened over and over and over in the UFO community. Many people wear the UFO hat and it's been fooled. We've been tricked. We've been lied to by the government, by all kinds of people out there who make up stuff. And lo and behold, if you had something besides the UFO hat, you might have not been fooled. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, let's Let's touch on the uh, spiritual hat for a second. There are a lot of folks out there who believe that these things are either angels or demons. What are your feelings on that? Well, again, it really goes back to uh, the best evidence. And if you're going to look at it from a, I have to use all my hats to describe uh, the phenomena. In other words, uh, um, the spiritual hat is only going to give me one view, and it may be the right view, but it, but the, all the other hats have got to contribute to that conversation, because if it does, and uh, it'll give you a far better picture. In other words, if uh, uh, let's suppose 
uh, the we're wearing our Native American hats, so to speak, and we think it's all uh, these are the star people from the universe or whatever, and that is a a, a, a valid belief of a, a number of different Native American tribes. These are the star people of France, so on and so on. But when you question that with the other hats, that story starts to fall apart. You realize that the beings come from out there, but the DNA, when you do the medical hat and so on, the DNA of each of these so-called aliens comes from planet Earth. Yeah, I've always wondered about that myself because, um, like, let's say the Mantis UFO or the Mantis alien thing, like, that... That creature, as described, is so close to our praying mantis here that it isn't funny. It's just bigger on a bigger scale and, you know, maybe smarter. But uh, I always wondered how that would come from somewhere else when we have that particular creature basically here. Well, it's highly unlikely that it did originate anywhere else. In my opinion, whoever they are that came here, originally they came and got, uh, and I, I'll go through this very quickly for your audience. Uh, the, um, the little gray alien, uh, I was talking to a Native American friend of mine uh, here a while back, and uh, in fact, he recently passed away. His name is Cliff Mahuti. And, and we were driving along up in the, in the south, Northwest, and uh, for hours we were talking, and I said, "So, tell me, uh, tell me about the uh, little gray alien. You know, tell me about him." He said, "Well, those are the star, star people," and I said, uh, "Don't feed me that garbage. That's what you tell white people. White people think anything told by somebody with brown skin that got feathers on his head, it's automatically the truth." I said, "I've heard that whopper for a long time." Tell me who they who he really is. He said, Well, they're I said, What did you originally call them? Your Zuni people. What did you call them? We called them the ant people. I said, Thank you. Not star people, yeah. ant people. Ant people. Where do ants live? He said, inside the earth. I said, Thank you. Now we've established where one of group of them come from. And then you got the uh, the, the bigger gray model, which is the doctor type. He's just smarter than the other one. Other one's got an IQ about 80. Doctor's got an IQ of about 135. The man's got an IQ of about 160 and is super sharp. And I said, uh, all these, the DNA of these creatures come from planet Earth. I said, I'm going to take a wild guess here, but they, let's look at the so-called Nordic alien. I'm going to take a wild guess and suppose that Nordic DNA probably comes from Norway. Just a wild guess. Yeah. But my point is that this is uh, this is an incredible reptile, the reptile alien. Uh, where are you going to get reptiles? Probably not from Uranus or from Pluto. Probably you're going to get it from planet Earth. We got plenty of samples here. This is a cosmic Walmart for DNA. Yeah. But the problem is somebody got that DNA, took it back out there, remanufactured it. And, and these are the process is called transgenics. And you literally mix the DNA with other things. Uh, somebody told me, he said, well, what about Bigfoot? I said, what about Bigfoot? I said, Bigfoot, according to Dr. Melba Ketchum, who did probably some of the best DNA work ever done on this sort of thing, found out that the, that the Bigfoot was a simian. No big shock there. It's an ape-like creature. But the second thing she found was rather amazing. It had mitochondrial or female Modern human woman DNA. Wow. How do you get modern woman human DNA in a Bigfoot? Yeah. It's called transgenics. Things that are hatched, made, cloned, and manufactured, then repositioned here, brought to Earth, and told they're aliens from other planets. And the alien, quote unquote, probably believes that story as well. They don't know where they're from. That that is really crazy to think about. It it really is. It's it's scary, really. It's about deception. 
I wonder what their end game is. That's what I want to know. Like, what I, I'm sure everybody wants to know that, but like, what is the end game here? Well, that the aliens never going to tell you that. Uh, but we have had, uh, I did uh, an experiment back in 1992 as the alien hunter. One of the things I do, having been in the intelligence community, was to set a trap for the alien in hopes that we would find out some really good information. And we did. And in the, that case, a mass abduction occurred between eight people in two states and several cities. They were taken aboard a massive craft by a smaller craft to a huge craft that we have a film of that's approximately 50 miles thick, 600 miles across. And in that craft, uh, two of the primary people taken were my senior investigator and the lady I programmed to uh, do this intelligence operation with to see if we could get the alien to respond to us. They did. And uh, they were, the, the alien themselves were stunned because they got completely fooled. But what happened was that two beings from, in my opinion, what I call mid-level management were brought aboard that craft to find out who, what the problem was, how the alien phenomena got penetrated. In other words, how did I break into their system? And they were pretty upset about it. They want to know how I did it and what I did and so on and so on. But the most important part of that whole thing, I think, is a remarkable statement made by two of the two of the ones that I call mid-level management. And they asked the, the two questions they asked my senior investigator and the lady I programmed was these questions. Produced a holographic brain in front of each of them, and they asked the question, point to the human soul. And the other one in the other room said, point to the human spirit. We want to know where it's at. How is it they didn't know? Yeah, that is. And why were they looking for it? Yeah, that is crazy. If you want to know what they're really up to, that's uh, you're, that's going to give you a better answer than all the guesses that people in the UFO community are making out there. Wow. That is, that's insane, man. It really is insane. So I know that you researched the very, very violent cases down in South America. And I just want to talk about those for a few minutes. What can you explain exactly what you were up against there? Well, most of the cases that are human mutilation cases that are referred to in Brazil, uh, most of them are referred to as a, there's one called the water Spanga case. And this is a man who had been found dead in the water. Some fishermen came by and saw the body floating in the water. And they were amazed that the fish had not, there was no predation upon the body at all. And when the police were finally notified, they brought the, the body out of the water and uh, laid it up. And uh, they it basically, they didn't tell the pathologists and the doctors who were looking at this dead body anything from the UFO community. They just left it and simply had them do their evaluation. They noticed it had a big part of the jaw missing. The, the anus was cored out very much like a cattle mutilation. Then after they did their evaluation, they brought some cattle mutilation pictures from the United States and presented them to the doctors. And the doctors all concluded this is one and the same thing. Wow. How often do you see human mutilation? I know that cattle mutilation is pretty widespread, or at least it used to be reported a lot more. How often do you see the human mutilation? Human mutilations, by and large, are pretty rare, I would say, more so now than ever before. But I was uh, discussing this issue with a Fife, Alabama cop who is uh, probably one of the better investigators of cattle mutilations. And his opinion was that all of this was the uh, Army was doing all this stuff, and it was them and not the alien. And I, uh, of course, we're buddies, and I said, uh, well, you're wrong. And he said, well, you got a case, make it. And I said, don't make me embarrass you in front of God and everybody. <laughs> and he says, you got a case, make it. And I said, okay. And I gave him a case out of 1980. Uh, I told him the case. I said, uh, tons of meat have been found by 
by his doctor and different people that had fallen from the air. Tons of meat over a wide area. Some of the meat were, in, in fact, uh, animal, different kinds of animals like uh, beef and this sort of thing. And some of it was human. Some of it was hearts, lungs, and they would have been sliced very thinly. Wow. And he said, but that still doesn't prove that, that the Army didn't do that. And I said, the case was in 1880. <laughs> yeah, it'd make it a little difficult. Did, who do you think did that in the CIA? Yeah. <laughs> wow. And it was widespread over, over a large area. And it's a well-documented case. My point about the issue is that this stuff's been going on for a long time, and its mutilation aspect of it may be more important back then than it is now, so to speak. Okay. So I got one more question for you. I know that you've been digging into this and researching cases for years and years, and you've seen a whole lot. But what is one thing that you've uncovered or learned about during your research it's really thrown you for a loop or stuck with you this whole time. Um, I, I guess, uh, I don't know if thrown for a loop is the right term, but uh, something that's quite interesting to me is, um, is the, it's, it's the, the lack of, um, the lack of hats used by many investigators. Most of them have got a UFO hat, and that's it. Yeah. And so that's all they use. And so when I tell them some of the things I've mentioned to you, they're scratching their head like, where in the world do you come up with all this stuff? And I said, it's called 50 years of research. 50 years. This is not guesswork and reading other people's books, putting things together and making wild guesses. Actually did my work. And it amazes me that, uh, and, and this is kind of a big one. I, I went to a, a UFO conference, a Dr. Leo Sprinkles conference before he passed away. And uh, most of the people there are contactees. They are the belief that the aliens are here to save the planet, fix the ozone hole, do all kinds of wonderful things, which they haven't done in 6,000 years, <laughs> but they're going to do it eventually. And so when I got up there and did my presentation, um, I told everybody I was kind of a nuts and bolts type guy. And uh, I said, uh, my point is that I said, uh, one of these days, I said, I think that to me, a lot of the UFO investigators are like a bunch of dogs barking at a big UFO bus driving by. They're all barking and making their appropriate noise, uh, their explanation of what they think the big UFO bus is. That's one of these days that UFO bus is going to stop and the door's going to open. And I think you're going to be real surprised when you see what gets off the bus. And all these little UFO dogs are going to be looking for a metaphorical fire hydrant to relieve themselves. But I don't think you're prepared for what the rest of the story actually is. Wow. In other words, if, if, if to, to use a modern example, in Houston, if you see a bus driving down the street, generally speaking, we have a bus driver. In rare cases, there may not be anybody in there, but most of the time, there's a driver of the bus. Right. And he knows where he's going. There's no difference between that and the UFO. Somebody's driving the bus, and people need to get their UFO hat off and put a different hat on and ask the question, who's driving the bus? That would be kind of nice to know. Yes, sir. I like it. I like it for sure. Well, hey, Daryl, I really appreciate you coming on the show, taking time out of your busy schedule to, to talk with me and address my audience. Um, where can everybody find your 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 books, all your uh, literature, anything that that involves you. If someone needs to get a contact with you, where can everybody find that? All you got to do is go to alienhunter.org, and in alienhunter.org uh, or alienhunter.com, either one will do it. And when you're there, you can click on books and things like that, and you can see that I've written a couple of them, one on evidence. But if you follow the, the book to the letter, you will find evidence. You will. Uh, 
he definitely will. Uh, I've written another one on alien implants. I've also got black lights for people to find physical evidence on themselves. So you just go to alienhunter.org and uh, click on it. And if you have any special questions for me or anything, I'll be glad to answer them. Uh, the service is free. You can just simply click on the bottom where it says Alien Hunter and it'll email me and I'll answer your questions. And you are super responsive too. I will say that. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, I'd love to have you back on if you'd be interested and uh, I appreciate it. Very good. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, bud. Well, that about does it for Dreamland tonight, dreamers. Thanks again for listening, and good night.